files and things like that. Ooh, recording. Okay. I'm Part so four. sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's, I'm totally, psychiatry teaches you to roll with everything. Part four is anecdotes of minority stress. So things that my colleagues and I gathered from other residents, as well as from patients, as well as from staff on how minority stress played out for them in the hospital setting. Part five will be how do we help and how do we grow? So I like to leave things on a high note. And then part six will be future directions of thought. So just some things to like get us thinking about how can we maybe help people who are going through minority stress and what kind of things do we still need to be thinking about? Part seven will be a Q&A. And so anything that we talk about is on the table. And also I'm very open to discussing my own things. I talk about my own mental health and struggles with mental health during residency in med, med school. Um, and I'm somebody who's living with depression that's in remission right now. So very free to talk about that stuff too. So what is identity? The typical definition is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. So I sit before you and I'm African-American and gay. That's what I would be pegged as and those are parts of my identity. More than that, however, identity is the way you think about yourself, the way the world views you and characteristics that define you. So although I'm African-American and gay, my friends from MIT actually used to call me a rainbow unicorn phoenix. And they said that they called me that because I was always rising from the ashes of discrimination and trying to spread magic throughout the world. I actually identify with that label much more than I identify with any other label I've had. Identity can be shaped by your culture and societal labels. So I'm pegged as African-American and gay, but that's not my own, those are not my only cultures. I also am African-American and gay. So I sit at the intersection of those two cultures. And I also, part of psychiatry is my culture as well, and then child psychiatry. So our culture is actually many different things and can be shaped by the environment around us. Identity helps with decision-making and community building. So I am fortunate that I get to be part of the gay community. There are problems that come along with that. However, it is something that has provided a lot of solace in my life. So as we go through things, thinking about how community is not only something that can be protective for people, but can also save their life. Identity is a good thing, but can identity also be a bad thing? The short answer is yes. The long answer is the drive to protect our identity can sometimes prevent us from being good and open-minded and compassionate and can be polarizing. So thinking about how America and how culture is played out and identity is played out, especially in the most recent years and since the 2016 election. Identity can also impact our mental health if we don't identify as being someone with good qualities. An example is if we identify as lazy, we'll be more inclined to act lazy. Another example that I always use is they actually did a study of African-Americans and compared them to white colleagues. And if you told an African-American person that they would score lower on the exam, they actually scored 10 points lower. And if you didn't tell them anything about the exam, they would score at the same level as their white colleagues. So the words that we use and the words that we put on to people actually can really shape who they are. Identity can also impact our mental health if others aren't open-minded and compassionate about how we identify ourselves. And so just looking at America, especially right now, and things around Asian Americans experiencing 150% increase in hate crimes, that's led to actually a sevenfold increase in depression and anxiety for Asian American populations. And that's all caused from bigotry around coronavirus. So thinking about how we actually are open to each other and how we protect other people and how we need to be open-minded and not judgmental around people's experiences. How identity is related to minority stress. So first we need the definition. What is minority stress? The typical definition is the process through which stigma directed towards sexual minorities influences health outcomes. So this, basically this definition came into vogue around 2003, and it was done during a study on LGBTQ plus Americans where they noted that these populations actually experienced specific stressors pertaining to their populations and towards their identity. And so this came to be minority stress. However, a lot of other cultures and other people noted that this definition wasn't just applying to LGBTQ plus people, but also applied to other racial minoritized and minoritized people in America. So the definition is actually now more broad than that. So out of that came minority stress theory, which is the more elegant explanation. Individuals from oppressed social groups experience excess stress and negative life events because of their non-dominant status or statuses, which can lead to or exacerbate mental health problems. 
These effects are unique, socioculturally based and long lasting, which means that they're additive. So the way that I explain it to people usually is think about getting a paper cut. You get one in a day and you're like, oh, all right, it heals, it's not that bad. Imagine getting a thousand paper cuts a day and you don't know how you got those paper cuts and then how those wounds, like where they actually came from. And then you're bleeding everywhere and you don't know how to actually stop the bleeding. Another way that I like to describe it is I watch a lot of Sailor Moon um, and the Japanese version because I think it's better. And so she has this thing called her shine or the silver crystal and it encapsulates basically all of who she is and her power. So imagine getting cracks in that shine and then it starts leaking light. Soon enough, if you actually crack that shine enough times, then it shatters. So that's what happens to minoritized people when they experience daily stressors that continually add upon each other. Along with this comes institutional discrimination, so disparities that systematically favor certain groups. This includes housing, so redlining where African Americans were only allowed to live in certain areas. And that was actually back in the day, but it's still playing out in many ways. So African Americans are less likely to get loans and their houses are appraised at lower rates. So it plays out there. And then it also plays out in schooling. An example of this is African Americans in the 90s were bused from one neighborhood to white neighborhoods to go to better schools. However, a lot of white people protested this in Boston. And so just thinking about how that was only a couple years ago or decades ago, oh my God, I'm old now. All right, this also plays out in employment, health, and justice. How does minority stress play out in America and in healthcare? So in terms of racial statistics, a study by psychologist Randy T. Lee looked at major lifetime discrimination and 48.9% of African-Americans, almost 50%, said that they experienced major lifetime discrimination that included verbal assaults, physical assaults, sexual assaults, um, other forms of racism, such as being bullied. That was versus 30.9% of white people. And when you think about the 30.9%, it also included women who are also statistically more likely to experience violence too. In terms of day-to-day -day discrimination, 44.4% of white people said they had never experienced any day-to-day -day discrimination. That's only versus 8.8% of African-Americans. This also played out in pay discrepancies where 57% of African-Americans 32% of Hispanic Americans, 31% of Native Americans, 25% of Asian Americans versus 13% of Caucasian Americans said that they experienced pay discrepancies. In terms of that, that means that they entered with the same amount of degrees or the same amount of experience and then were passed over for promotions or received lesser pay. This slide is a little bit busy, but what I wanna draw your attention to is the right column. So it's looking at regular day-to-day -day discrimination. And so 3.82% of white people said, yes, they experienced discrimination regularly. That was compared to 11.23% of black people and then 10.85% of white or Asian Americans. If you look down the whole column, every minoritized group experiences discrimination at higher rates than white people do. So how does this play out for LGBTQ plus Americans? So they did a study of different high schools across America in youth identifying as LGBTQ+. All sexual minorities reported higher rates of violence victimization that included feeling unsafe, forced to have sexual intercourse, being threatened with a weapon, bullied at school or online. An example of this is in terms of gay males being bullied, that was seen at 27.7% versus 14.6% of heterosexual Americans. Lesbians also reported higher use of cigarette and marijuana use what used to be thought about and what was taught in med school and still is in some ways is that maybe these populations actually experience high rates of substance use just because of their genetics or they have some inborn quality that makes this happen to them. What's being seen as time goes on and as minority stress is more studied is that people are using these substances as well as using other coping mechanisms that are seen as unhealthy because of what they experience in terms of minority stress in America. So yes, genetics do play some role, but we also really need to think about the environment that they live in. There was also a higher prevalence of cocaine, heroin, methamphetamines, ecstasy, and inhalant use in sexual minority groups. And this also plays out in the prevalence of suicide attempts. So for lesbian and gay people, their prevalence of suicide attempts was 24.3% versus 13.1% for heterosexual Americans. Bisexual Americans was 28.3% versus 23.2%. And just remember, these are different high schools that they were studying. And in terms of unsure, the statistics actually reverse. 
So it's 12.4% who said they were unsure had a prevalence of suicide attempts versus 14.9%. They think that the reason for this is actually because people who said that they were unsure might have been able to camouflage or blend into society better and did not experience overt discrimination and were not stereotyped and then experiencing discrimination. In terms of drawbacks of the study, there were actually, they think that there were higher dropout rates. So thinking about somebody getting to high school, if they are gay or seen as stereotypically gay or have gay traits, they actually might have dropped out before they even reach high school and weren't able to participate in the study. So we might be underestimating the prevalence and rates of these things. And since the 2016 election, this has only actually gotten worse. The FBI keeps track of hate crimes that are actually reported. And so they might be underestimating there too. But every year since the 2016 election, minoritized groups have been experiencing increasing rates of violence towards them. So thinking about how we protect our patients and that almost every minoritized patient who comes into the hospital has experienced some trauma in some form. So always being conscious of that. So how does this play out for Asian American sexual minorities? Previous studies that were done on LGBTQ plus populations demonstrated poor mental health, but these were in predominantly Caucasian or L white LGBTQ plus samples. So a study re research demonstrated that external racial stressors among Asian Americans resulted in greater psychological distress. A study done at the University of Tennessee showed that Asian American LGBTQ plus persons experienced rejection prejudice and discrimination from the overall LGBTQ plus community. So one thing to always keep in mind is that just because someone is part of a community does not mean that they are safe inside of that community. There is a huge amount of racism that occurs in the LGBTQ plus populations as well as transphobia and things of that nature. So always asking somebody about their lived experience inside of a community. There was also increased internalized heterosexism or internalized homophobia because of violating traditional Asian values such as harmony and complementarity. And among 314 LGBTQ plus people of color studied, 58 of whom were Asian American, they saw higher rates of depression, perceived stress and need for acceptance. And they also saw internalized heterosexism from within versus the general society. So that, that's something to also think about inside of racial groups how accepted is somebody for being LGBTQ plus? So somebody who sits at the intersection of those groups can actually experience negative stressors from both groups and can experience protective things from both groups. So always thinking about that as well. Along with this comes ethnosexual mythology. So this is basically, if we reduced it to another word, it would be fetishizing. Um, an example that I always give is when I was in Boston and then before in Chicago, when I was on Grindr, because like what else was I doing with my life besides studying medicine, um, there was actually a lot of people who would open their messages with like, oh, I love your black skin, or I love that black like member, which I will not say because we are in a more professional atmosphere, but it was basically saying that because I was black, I would have a certain bigger member, and so they wanted that. It's reducing somebody to sexual characteristics and reducing somebody to their skin color without actually seeing them as a person. Along with this, they study competing identities and resilience that came out from being Asian American and LGBTQ+. Along with this comes intersectionality. So it's something we always need to mention with minority stress. Intersectionality is the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender, which create overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. It also can create advantages as well. The example that I give is when I walk by police people, no matter if it's daylight out or if it's nighttime, I actually get pretty scared still, um, just because of things that have happened in America, even though nothing has happened personally to me on that front. But what I do is I actually change how I walk. So I walk in a more stereotypically gay manner and I will inflect my voice upwards. So it doesn't it makes me less of a threat. So intersectionality can actually lead to somebody having protective qualities too. Along with this comes the intersectionality paradox. An example of this is an African-American woman with higher education levels will actually have less or has been shown to have less like rates of depression compared to white people with the same education status. They think that this is occurring because maybe they were in a higher socioeconomic status and this actually protected them in some ways. Along with this comes the multiple jeopardy perspective, which is also known as the multiple disadvantages approach which is also known as the multiple hierarchy stratification. An example of this is an Asian American bisexual female in America would be assigned three low status hits. 
in the reverse would be a white Caucasian heterosexual male would be assumed to be the jackpot in America and would be assigned three high status traits. However, we need to always look at identity and experience because if you notice, it doesn't mention socioeconomic standing, it doesn't mention somebody's lived experience. So it always is reminding us that even though somebody might be born into privilege, we actually need to think about the experiences that they've had inside of that privilege and also how things might have not gone well for them. So that's why I'm a psychiatrist is always thinking about the need for the story behind somebody and why they are the way they are. What's missing from this? So after Mark and I, when we first did this project did an extensive search on PubMed on Google, we went down Wikipedia because like, honestly, everybody does it. And then also plus one in ResearchGate. If you notice, LGBTQ plus research often lumps all categories together. So it doesn't say like African-American and gay. It doesn't say transgender and Asian American. It actually usually puts people in one group and says LGBTQ plus people. That actually basically kind of mitigates the experiences that other groups might have had within the LGBTQ community. There's also a dearth of research on intersectionality that is changing as time goes on. Women are also minoritized when using this model. If you think about medicine, a lot of women are not promoted and they are, if you look at your basically like the structure of academia, women are not only not promoted, but they aren't like in the upper echelons of medicine as well. So thinking about using this model for women as well. And then also need to look at further racial minority groups. When, you, when I showed you that chart earlier, it usually says things like Asian Americans or Hispanic Americans. There are a lot of subgroups within those groups. So thinking about how we need to actually delve into more research. This also applies to elderly populations. So elderly people sometimes actually have to go back in the closet if they're LGBTQ plus when they go to like SNFs or nursing homes. So this act, minority stress model actually applies to them as well. So how does minority stress play out regarding patients? A couple definitions first. The first is microaggressions, which are broadly defined as behaviors that ambiguously disempower racial minorities. There are three categories underneath that. The first is microassaults or explicit acts of racism or saying someone is of lesser worth. The next is micro insults, saying somebody didn't earn their position. An example of this is when I went to med school, I became class president very early on and that was voted on by all of my colleagues and peers. Somebody then said to me that I won class present because I was African American and gay. And I actually had to stop them and say that the reason I won class present because, was because I was the only person to do a PowerPoint presentation and to give an actual speech. So saying that somebody didn't earn their position and devaluing their efforts, that happens a lot to minoritized people. Micro invalidations also come along with this saying we are all the same. We are not the same, we are all different and we all have different stories. Inside of this is healthcare microaggressions, which originate from aversive racism, saying we aren't prejudiced, we don't have racist tendencies. We all are, have racist tendencies. We are born into America, which was built upon racism. So those things are imbued upon us when we actually are growing up. So we all have biases and prejudices. It's much more about acknowledging that that happens and then figuring out how to work against those prejudices. Along with this comes a term that's one of my favorite terms, but it's kind of a bad thing. Um, so institutional betrayal. So what happens is if somebody minoritized comes to somebody in the upper echelon, so let's say a medical student comes to a dean and says, I've been experiencing discrimination from my classmates. How that dean responds will actually portend how that student feels in a lot of ways and their mental health outcomes. If that dean does not respond appropriately and those people who have been discriminatory are not followed up with and actually there's no accountability, then it normalizes such behaviors and actually makes the person who experienced those discriminatory events feel institutional betrayal. That's actually playing out on a large scale in America if you think about it. So transgender Americans are experiencing a lot of hate crimes right now. Not only that, senators across America are introducing a lot of hate, bill, hate crime bills and anti-trans policies. So America is not responding appropriately to those policies and it's normalizing discrimination against transgender people. In 2007, Constantine looked at the impact of racial microaggressions on mental health and treatment of African-Americans. What they saw was a lot of minimization or saying what you experienced was not that big of a deal and over-identification saying that I understand exactly what you're going through. We can never understand fully what somebody is going through. All we can do is say that we empathize and that we provide space for them. In 2017, Fitzgerald looked at vignettes to examine the influence of patient characteristics on attitudes, diagnoses, and treatment decisions. 
Nearly all, so 35 out of the 42 articles, found evidence of implicit bias. That was around race, age, socioeconomic status, mental illness, weight, having AIDS, people with TBIs or traumatic brain injury, people who use substances, disability, social circumstance, and gender. So basically, I like implicit bias plays out in every facet of America and in healthcare. There were actually the same levels of implicit bias as the wider population. So if you think about it, I always describe the hospital system as the microcosm of the macrocosm that is America. If you took America and shrunk it down to hospital size, you'd see the same exact rates of discrimination occurring. When physicians were less certain of coronary artery disease for middle-aged women, those women were more likely to receive mental health diagnoses compared to men. And intersectionality can actually play a large role in protection. So when I talked about basically like being African-American and gay and around police people, that not only plays out inside of America, but plays out in the hospital system. And women and other people who are minoritized can use different parts of themselves to actually protect themselves in the hospital system. How does this play out regarding residents? So what I'm going to talk about is how it plays out with re residents specifically but a lot of the things that we will talk about play out with minoritized populations as well. In 2016, Lisi looked at bullying, repeated acts or practices directed at one or more workers, unwanted by the victim, done deliberately or unconsciously, but clearly cause offense, humiliation, and distress, and may interfere with job performance and or cause unpleasant working environments. Examples of this were unjustified criticism, humiliation in front of colleagues, intimidatory use of discipline or competence procedures, undermining personal integrity and shifting goalposts. So shifting goalposts is when a medical student comes in and the attending says to get in honors in this course, you need to do X, Y, and Z. They do X, Y, and Z. And then the attending says, you also need to do A, B, and C. They do A, B, and C. And then the attending says, you also need to do D, E, and F. They're shifting the goal line so that person will never achieve honors. And it's actually a discriminatory and abusive practice. 69.8% of residents in the US have experienced workplace abuse. The most common form of abuse was verbal in nature. In terms of types of resident mistreatment and themes, there was a lot of hierarchy that was seen. That's why I tell people to call me Chase. I'm trying to flatten the hierarchy as much as possible. There was also silence, incognizance, and fear. 79% of residents said they were afraid to report because of backlash they had either experienced or heard of others experiencing. There was also acceptance and denial. So saying what happened to me wasn't that bad or denying it and saying, oh, what happened to me didn't happen. This also goes along with gaslighting and that's usually something you see as a fallout of that. There's also the legacy of abuse. And so it was noted that if medical students experience workplace abuse, then they, and they went on to become residents or attendings, they were more likely to abuse the incoming medical students as well. So what we need to do is figure out how do we break that cycle of abuse and how do we actually protect people when they go through abuse during the workplace. Lisi also looked at the sequelae of resident mistreatment. It plays out on an individual and systemic level. There's a cost to the system. There are higher rates of medical errors, harm to patients, and dissolution of care. 67% of residents who witnessed disruptive behavior felt it contributed to adverse events for patients as well as other staff. There's also a cost to the individual with higher burnout rates, thoughts of desertion, higher rates of depression, also stress. There are actually some studies that are coming out that, looking, that are looking at how people who experience workplace abuse actually have PTSD symptoms like nightmares and hypervigilance and hyperawareness. There was also higher rates of substance use as well as suicidal ideation. 20% of residents said they would not pursue medicine again and several would advise others not to pursue. So I just wanna pause here just because we've gone through a lot of things and just to give a heads up, we're going to give some anecdotes next and basically go through stories that either myself or Mark gathered when we were in residency. These are things that patients experience, that staff experience, that other people experience. And it's not just minoritized people, but for everybody. So I always wanna pause here. And if anything bothers you while we go through it, feel free to take a break and feel free to like step away if you need to. Um, we tried to make sure that like there's nothing overly egregious in here. There were some other stories that I always like to give people that heads up. Blank, so a staff member voicing concern that a black patient was dangerous because they were listening to rap music loudly while pacing the unit. An elderly Hispanic man admitted for dementia, psychosis, and paranoia. The treatment team was rounding with the patient in the ICU. The patient became very agitated and angry because in his psychosis, he believed I had assaulted him at the facility where he lives. 
So this person who was telling the story is an African-American gay social worker who I was not working with at the time, but still remembers how this played out for him. The Spanish interpreter reported that the patient was making racial statements and wanted me to leave the room. Not knowing how to correctly respond, the resident gave me a look that seemed to suggest that for the sake of the interview, I should leave. Feeling shocked by the resident's response and the lack of response from the attending, I felt I had to do what was being asked. Needless to say, I felt unsupported, stigmatized, and invalidated. I believe the resident and or the attending should have told the patient that was part of the team and would need to stay. He still remembers this event and he remembers specifically the resident that it happened with and the attending. So thinking about how do we protect our team members and how do we stand up for them in the room, because it's not always about changing a patient's behavior, but it's about protecting your team members. There were also differences noted in attending evaluations when colleagues stated that the minoritized person worked twice as hard and was twice as good. There's this old adage of minoritized people work twice as hard to get half as far. People who are minoritized being interrupted by attendings when others who are not minoritized were not interrupted. Minoritized people being told their answer was wrong when they were citing directly from the reading. Along with this comes the minority tax. So when somebody comes into the system and they're minoritized, they are often tasked with having to lead diversity events or they are tasked with fixing diversity at that institution and fixing racism. That is not their job. They did not sign up for that and they were not usually aware that that was happening. So it's basically a tax that they have to fulfill on top of doing their other jobs as well. An example of this is a lot of the things I did at MGH, my program director later on said that I didn't have to do the things I did, but it helped change her and change the program. And then she described it as having a third, fourth, and fifth job, as well as being a resident. Along with this comes tokenization. So if you notice, a lot of institutions will say we support Black Lives or have the pictures of Black Lives Matter on their banner head or something of that nature. If you ask those people who actually attend those universities who are minoritized, they feel as though they often don't have the power that they need to but that doesn't stop them from being splashed across the website in pictures, but they actually hold no power. Residents have also been made to feel and sometimes as though they are the problem when they bring an issue to the fore. An attending had said that he actually worked well with other African-Americans before and they'd worked well together. When checked up, this was not true for other African-Americans. Wait staff who were mainly minoritized being told by a patient that they could finish the food left on a patient's tray. Wait staff being told instead of asked what to do in a room. Constant misgendering of transgender patients and saying when rooming them, well, they're not actually a female, we need to think about the safety of other patients who have trauma from men. A sign out email saying that because a person had trauma with African Americans, do not room with a black person instead of moving that person who had the issue. Staff sometimes saying that clearly a person has a personality disorder and noting that often occurs with LGBTQ plus patients. To describe this a little bit more, um, this happens a lot in psychiatry. So, Personality disorders are basically when, oh wait, I mean, yeah. So I think most people know what personality disorders are, but basically it's a structuring of somebody's personality where they react in a certain way to certain instances and certain threats. This is something that shouldn't be stigmatized because those people are reacting in a way that actually has helped them in a lot of ways before and might be maladaptive now, but it still means that they actually got through situations previously by using the, the structuring of their personality that they have. This is a diagnosis that's, that's often thrown onto LGBTQ plus patients. So a lot of LGBTQ plus patients who come into psych facilities are labeled with things such as borderline personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder. What's being noted is that actually if you go through the criteria, they don't fit criteria, they would fit criteria instead for minority stress. So thinking about our own biases and how they play out towards other minoritized populations and how we stigmatize patients in their charts. Hearing that a patient is difficult or aggressive and sure enough they're a minoritized person. Looking at notes and seeing how race is brought into the one-liner for specific patients. So if you look in a lot of notes, they won't say 43-year-old white male, but they will say 34-year-old African-American male with history of aggression. And so that actually stigmatizes a patient before you even meet them and also portends actually poor care. Staff and patients also noting how there are no pictures of minoritized physicians on the wall. So how accepted is a person when they come to a facility? So how do we help and how do we grow? The first thing we do is we ask. When Mark and I did this presentation, we didn't have this caveat, but I started adding this later on. So when asking somebody can be invasive um, and it can be something that they don't wanna talk about. 
So the way that I've heard it done, the way I do it with patients is I always ask first if they identify as somebody who's minoritized in America and I ask how they identify as a minoritized person. If they identify as minoritized, then later on in the conversation, I will say, I understand that you mentioned that you're minoritized in America. And I know that in America, there are higher rates of hate crimes, there are higher rates of substance use and things of that nature. I am here to listen to your story if you want to talk about being minoritized in America, but I understand that you might not want to, but I want you to know that whenever you do want to discuss it, I will be here for you. That gives them an out so they don't have to discuss those things if they want to, or if they don't want to, because asking somebody is not only invasive, but it can take a lot of energy for them. We also need to educate ourselves and not ask patients to educate us all the time. This happens especially with transgender populations. We need to protect minoritized people and become actual allies. There's this danger of false allies where people say that they're supportive of minoritized people, but you need to actually look at how does that play out when a minoritized person brings an issue to them. We need to come at this from humility and from seeking to understand and truly converse. We need to do this because in medicine, we're often taught that we can't be wrong. We get things wrong all the time and we will get things wrong around discrimination and racism. We need to think about how do we apologize when we do make mistakes because that's important to the healing process for some people. We also need to believe minoritized people when they bring issues forward and we need to ask, but always with that caveat of giving somebody an out if they don't wanna discuss things or they don't have the energy. How do we heal? So Lisi again in 2016 looked at basically how do you help residents and people who had suffered workplace abuse heal? A lot of these things map to how to help heal minoritized people as well. Education and awareness in and of itself actually led to in decrease in bullying. So just coming to this lecture and being more aware of the terms that you are used and also thinking about when you see something, now you're more aware of what that means for some minoritized populations that actually leads to decreased bullying. Team-based care at all levels led to reducing the hierarchy. Good leadership led to prevention and protection and defined culture. Interphysician support led to greater mentoring and fostering community. There's also a need for confidential mental health services. So when medical students and residents come into a new university, it's often hard for them to find mental health access and resources. What we need to start thinking about building is an opt-out service where you come in and you're matched with a therapist or psychiatrist or group. And so you can always say like, oh, I don't need this right now. But then if you do experience an issue later, you're already linked with somebody so you don't have to scramble to find some help. We also need to develop curriculum that tackles the hidden curriculum because half of medicine is not is learning like random facts. Half of medicine is the social navigation that somebody has to perform every day just to get through. We also need to standardize feedback and reporting mechanisms with actual safe mechanisms. And in the worst case scenario, we need to plan ex exit strategies. So let's say a university actually continues to discriminate against somebody and they are not safe there, then we need to think about how do we get them to a university where they are safe, where they can continue their education. We also need to recognize name and understand these attitudes and actions, identify our own implicit biases, and we need to do diversity training and not only about diversity now, a lot of med schools don't talk about racism within their own institution because there's this thing about, oh, we didn't do anything wrong or we don't wanna bring these things up. We know that these things happen and they will continue happening unless we speak about them openly and if we and we need to train people so they are aware of those things that happen at institutions. We also need to do continued research and address patients social risk factors and needs and diversify the healthcare workforce. This also comes with a caveat now so back in the day I used to think that bringing in diverse people like at any level was actually useful then through my own experiences as well as the experiences of others you need to bring in people who have the power to change things. So yes, somebody who is a resident, somebody who is a medical student can speak up, but they often don't have enough power. Whereas if you bring in a dean who is minoritized, they can not only protect people who are coming in after them, but they can also have the power to change things that are necessary to be changed. And I also have included some further reading if you guys want, but I like barely have time to read any of my own things ever. So like, don't worry about it. In terms of future directions of thought, what are some ways in which we can protect people of minority status when they enter institutions where minority stress happens? What further research can we do into minority stress in female and other underrepresented minority populations? How long does it take roughly for people who have experienced minority stress to recover? So that's something that I'm particularly interested in because now I'm actually in recovery at UCSF. Um, for the last seven years, I had lived with depression and suicidal ideation. 
and I feel my depression is completely in remission, but that I want to, we need to know how does that work out for other people because we have an N of one right now. So how does that work out for other populations and how do we help them with recovery? What are some ways in which people do recover and don't recover? What aids in that recovery? How do they protect themselves in the future when entering an environment that is unsafe for them? How do institutions facilitate productive conversations? What is our role in speaking on these topics to a larger audience? So that's why I use Twitter a lot because I feel as though it's my duty as a physician to not only speak about this with patients, but also to speak about it to a broader audience so people don't feel as alone. And then also we need to standardize our study methods and terminology. So with special thanks to Mark, I always give him a shout out because he's like an amazing colleague. We still keep in touch and we like ask each other what we're eating for dinner every night. And he's gonna be going to Stanford later to do his neuro fellowship. Um, and then also to Nat and PsychSign for reaching out and having me here today and all my other mentors past and present. Okay, so Q&A and sources cited, which we don't care about either. All right, that is everything. So one question I have is, um, so I, either as like a minority, you, you know, your, ourselves, or when we see someone else facing discrimination, how do we both like stand up for ourselves and stand up for others when we still have that fear of, um, you know, negative repercussions, whether it's, you know, like facing someone who's, you know, in, in charge or someone of a higher authority of us, um, how do we like, how are you able to like call them out when we still have that fear that something bad may happen to us? Yes, that is an excellent question. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that whatever I respond with or however I respond to questions, there's the caveat of think about the situation that you're in and if you're safe to do the things that I'm talking about. Because all I care about, honestly, is keeping all of you safe um, and making sure that you get through things safely. So personally, it's changed for me as time has gone on. When I first started dealing with this, especially when I was a medical student, I used to take people aside and speak with them privately. Um, and the way I would do that is I would ask them what they meant by like what they had said. That kind of flips it back onto them and then makes them think through what they had said previously. What I realized as time went on is that then people who were actually racist and then didn't handle those conversations well could then go and say to other people whatever they wanted that I was uppity, that I was somebody who was making complaining about things, that I didn't know what I was talking about, that I, I, there was an attending who went and told my program director I had rolled my eyes at her. I hadn't um, because I needed to actually look at her so I could like figure out what she was talking about and how rude she was being. Um, but that's something that you hear from minoritized populations a lot of. Um, so I actually now thread the needle very carefully. And what I do is I call people out in person. Um, I will do it so other people are around me and can be backup. They might not say anything, but then if the, like, the instance of discrimination or whatever happens is reported to like my program leadership, then I can say, oh, I have these other 10 people who were there and actually saw exactly what happened too. So it's a lot of chess maneuvers. Um, it is, it does involve like finally like threading that needle because you don't want to just be like, that was racist because somebody will then immediately have their guard up. The way I do it is I, I basically will repackage what they said and then direct it back to them as a question. So let's say somebody calls me a certain word. I will then say, hey, you just called me this word and I just am curious, is that what you meant? And so it flips it back to them as a question and they have to sit there and then respond to me. And it slows people down for a second because what that is playing out is a lot of their implicit biases. And so slowing them down in front of other people makes them think about, oh, this might not be socially appropriate right now. Doesn't always work, but it is one of the things I've done. The other thing that I've done is actually power through vulnerability. Um, and I think in medicine, we're taught a lot of the time, don't be vulnerable. You have to have your guard up at all times. But sometimes I will say to people, what you said actually is making me really anxious right now. And I actually have cold hands and I'm having a panic attack because of what you said. Is that what you meant to happen? And so it puts people on their heels in a lot of ways. Again, this is like different maneuvers. So I basically have a Rolodex of responses. Um, and so thinking about how do you want to frame something and put it back to somebody else so they can answer you, as well as the other thing is, 
setting limits is kindness. Um, I think a lot of the times that it, we have this thought of like, if I set limits, I'll be seen this way, this way, this way. If you don't set limits, then it leads to you experiencing like more distress yourself. And then you'll have to sit with that when you leave the hospital, when you go home, when you wake up the next day and have to interact with that person. Setting limits in those moments, if you're able to do so and feel safe, actually kind of can help you purge those feelings a little bit. Um, those are a couple of the things that I've done. The other thing is that after a while, I kind of in residency built a reputation for speaking up and I was always seen as kind. And at first I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get in so much trouble. I'm going to be like that, like black person with an attitude. But people always said that I did it very kindly. And then also when somebody would go up against me later on or say something in example, I'll give you an example. Um, we had a lecture on PTSD and during it, there was something that came up and I was like, oh, something that residents experience. And I saw one of my attendings who actually trained with us, who became an attending recently, roll her eyes while I was talking. And so I stopped the whole room and I was like, I saw you roll your eyes just now. And I was wondering why you did that. And so then she like backed down and she, she well, what, actually what she said first was, well, I think comparing residency to any other trauma, which I hadn't, I hadn't compared it to anything. She like, was like, oh, you comparing that to any other kind of trauma is totally inappropriate. And I was like, I actually have suicidal ideation sometimes and I wake up with nightmares screaming about things that have happened during residency. You should have seen her face crumble. She was like, oh, and then she apologized later in front of the whole room. What happened after that is a colleague came up to me and she was like, didn't she know who she was going up against? And I was never mean about it, but I set limits very carefully. And I was showing my other colleagues that it is okay to set limits. The way I think about it is I love Harry Potter, even though like JK Rowling is problematic, but there's this part in Deathly Hallows where Neville says to Harry, like, I noticed that when you spoke up, it helped other people speak up. And I've seen that play out. So sometimes like, I will take that on because I know it will help other people in the room feel like maybe it's okay to speak up to. Um, so those are some examples. I hope that helps. I can dive more into that if any of you want me to. Sounds good, thank you. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Well, I, I'm stressed I, about America, but I'm good. How are you? <laughs> Same, same. I'm happy to see you um, speaking in the flesh, actually, uh, because you know I just been interacting with you on Twitter here and there. But um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, how do you address like the minority tax with fellow students? Because I, uh, yeah, that's it's been really challenging, especially the past year, and you know, working with with my colleagues and just seeing, you know, how far we have to go, even amongst our peers, um, you know, not only with, you know, the high, dealing with the hierarchy, but even just, you know, with one another um, is very daunting. So I was wondering if you had any tips on that. Yeah. So that has also been an evolution for me. This is why I do this talk. So I'm trying to teach the next generation like a little bit earlier about things that I learned like through experience just to be like yo like this is stuff that might happen so I really love that question and in terms of the minority tax my evolution has been at the beginning I was like oh I will like change so much of Northwestern I worked with like deans and vice deans and I changed people and it was like but I became more depressed and more suicidal during that period and I was just like oh my god and the best thing that happened was at the end of third year, um, I was walking along Lake Michigan and it was after I had seen my friends from MIT. Um, so thinking about community, my friends from MIT, whenever I visited them, I was like always much better and felt better. But I was walking along Lake Michigan where even a month ago, I'd actually been contemplating suicide. Um, and that month at the end, of, near the end of third year, I was like, you've given enough. You have done enough. You have been a class president who people say have gone above and beyond. You helped your class through two deaths in your class. Like you have done enough. Um, and then I was like, it is okay to take a step back. It is okay to breathe. It is okay to accept your depression. Cause I'd been fighting against it for so long too. Um, and I was like, it is okay to not do everything. Um, 
that is not your job you did not sign up as like um like black gay person to come fix northwestern and yes we were making changes with the vice dean like yes i got to work with some amazing people but i thought about what is the personal cost um the other thing is so after that i start i started teaching other people how to fix their own problems because at the beginning i was trying to fix everything for people at mit that was great because it was very symbiotic where we would help each other in medicine and in med school too often which is really sad people just take and take and take and you have nothing left at the end so i needed to set my own limits on that um so i started teaching people my fellow colleagues how to fix their own problems or i would ask them like why are you coming or well i would say this obviously nicer but you're bringing this issue to me what have you done to like research this issue what have you done so far to educate yourself and what are your possible solutions for this issue so that actually started teaching people like on their own to figure out their own things during residency because i was coming in with that mentality it actually helped me a lot um where later on with dinners and things like that they would be like oh because like you represent this like mgh so well can you come to these like minoritized dinners or speak to this minoritized person and i was like at first i did it because i was like okay it'll like make me look better it'll be good and i was like why do i want to bring more black people into this environment and so i had to like reflect on my own self and i was like is it good for me to be bringing in other people is it good for me to be like somebody who is on their website and say like because that presents that things are okay and so what i started telling them was like i actually don't feel comfortable going to dinners because of these experiences that i've gone through here i don't feel comfortable with reaching out to medical students or to having people shadow me because there you are wanting to present a certain image that you have not worked on so that actually made people just take a step back and realize like wow we've maybe really been missing how bad this is for people in the fact that somebody doesn't want to bring people to this university now. Um, the other thing that also happened was I have a colleague Jack Turbin I think some of you might follow him on Twitter he's like amazing and like we went to MGH together and both like got out at the same time. Um, he turned to me one day and he was like if after all these efforts of like changing your program director changing this institution they are still enacting some of these behaviors. What if you could have been using that energy to help 50 LGBTQ plus people who needed your help and were ready for your help and wanted your help? So I changed tactics. And that's when I started my like anonymous Twitter account at that time and started reaching out to the people who have been made to feel lonely. Um, I think that actually, that's part of why I'm not depressed anymore. And also UCSF is just like amazing and I love it. But that was also part of it like now I get to reach out on Twitter and like I'm doing this kind of conversation with all of you. I would have not been doing this if I was still trying to fix my institution. I decided to use my efforts in the way I wanted. Some other people might say like oh fix your university do this and that might be their prerogative and their way of doing things, but for the minority tax and how that played out for me that was not my best way of using my energy. Um, I hope that answers everything. Okay. Um, I think we have a question. Um, would you be okay with sharing your email or contact information for any follow up questions? Yes, um, I you guys can all email me. I'm going to tell you that I'm like hosed by emails a lot of the time. So like if it takes me a little while to get back to you, it's not you. I love all of you. It's me. And like time management is not my thing sometimes. Um, but yeah, I am very open to helping out in questions. The way that I actually usually interact more quickly is on Twitter. Um, and there's also like gay med Twitter and like psych med Twitter and med Twitter that are really good environments um, that have been helpful to people. So there's also that as well. Um, any other questions or thoughts or feelings? Because I'm here for all of it. Okay, if there are any other things that come up, Alexandra, I'm going to turn it back over to you, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was letting the 
silence <laughs> rights. I feel like I, you know, I say all the time, like as a budding psychiatrist, I am fine with silence and I like to sit in those feelings. So waiting to see if anybody else had anything to say before I'm taking it back. Um, Chase, I want to thank you so much for coming and joining us today and giving that talk. I know for me, you definitely reinvigorated me after I just graduated starting res residency next month. Um, definitely gave me some things to think about while, you know, joining a new institution. So thank you so much. Uh, it was great. Um, yeah, if no one has anything else to say, we have our next talk at four. It's the reproductive medicine talk. If anyone's staying for that, then I'll see you then. Um, but other than that, thank everybody. Thank you all for joining our talk. And thank you so much, Chase, again. Yeah, thank you for hosting and thank you everybody for being here. It was really awesome to meet all of you and I hope to interact with you more in the future. So. Have a good night. Hi, Dr. Oric. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Um, my name is Alexandra. I'm the Region 1 Chair for Psych Sign. I'll be moderating today. Awesome. Where are you headed to residency? Um, Zucker Hillside, Hofstra. Oh, nice. I did a lot of moonlighting at LIJ um, okay. and had a great experience uh, while I was in residency. Yeah, I've heard good things. I'm excited. <laughs> they pay better for moonlighting than all the other residencies, uh, residency yeah. programs. <laughs> yeah. So if you're interested in moonlighting, you're in, you're at the right place. Perfect. <laughs> um, so we'll we'll get started in a few minutes. I have a question.